We also need to talk about some common types of cash flows and we need to think deeply about a few types of cash flows that are really tricky and sometimes that either get overlooked or we uh, um, don't think about them deeply enough and so we don't associate the right types of cash flows and sometimes we associate cash flows that aren't relevant to this kind of project analysis. So we're gonna look at the most common types, the most common hiccups. These are, these are mostly just, um, these first three, these are real problems with uh, humans in general. We just have a really hard time seeing these types of costs. So we'll just walk our way through and then we'll talk about which ones matter and which ones don't when we're evaluating projects. So this first cost is called a sunk cost. And a sunk cost is a cost that has already occurred. And this is, a, again, this is a really hard thing for just people in general to move away from. Uh, and, and we see sunk cost and, and uh, cropping up in all kinds of decision making and affecting all kinds of decision making in a, in a, in a negative way. In fact, this cost is, uh, this cost and this effect on decision making is so common, it's given rise to a, a term that you may have heard before called the sunk cost fallacy which is when we make a decision based on a cost that's already occurred, sunk, that the cost is already sunk, and we make that decision incorrectly because we, we wrongly associate that as a relevant cost. So for our purposes, sunk costs are business expenses that we have already, um, that, that have already been spent. So one of the most common ones to think about is a piece of land that we've bought 10, maybe 15 years ago. Whatever we paid for the land 15 years ago, let's say I bought an empty lot on King Street for a million dollars 10 years ago. That cost of the land that I paid 10 years ago, that is sunk. And so it's not relevant to the project at hand. What is relevant to the project at hand is the current value of the land. The sunk cost isn't relevant. It doesn't matter what I paid. If the value of the land went up, great. If the value of the land went down, too bad, I lost some money. Right? What's relevant to the project is what the current value of the land is. So sunk costs, they crop up in all kinds of other things. You see them all often uh, in things like playing poker. If you've ever played Texas Hold'em, you know the Texas Hold'em takes place in a, in a round uh, in rounds of betting, so you, you get a couple of cards, then you make a bet, then you get another card and you make a bet, then you get another card and you make a bet. Right? What's relevant to each different card and the way it changes your hand is only that round itself. Everything that's already been bet, everything that's already on the table, those are sunk costs. So you might have bet tons of money thinking that you had a great hand and that the final card was going to make your straight or give you a royal flush or whatever. And if that final card doesn't come up, you need to fold your hand regardless of how much money you have already sunk into the pot. But the fallacy and what we see so many people doing is they have an inability to forget how much money they've already spent. And they say, oh my gosh, I've already got $1,000 in the pot. I've got to consider all this money that I've already spent, otherwise I'm a, I've lost. So I'll just stay in and I'll bet more and I'll lose more. We see this often also sort of in a, uh, in a personal setting, uh, if any of you have ever like had a friend who's got an, an old beater car that they keep fixing, and every time something new breaks, you say, "Dude, why are you still fixing this car? Just go get a, just go buy a new one and start paying on a new one." And they say, "But I, I just spent twelve hundred dollars on a transmission, and last month I spent six hundred dollars on new brakes." And what they are failing to recognize, and again, this is just a human fallacy. What, but what you're failing to recognize is that. All those costs don't matter anymore. You are going to keep spending money on this beater car as you keep fixing all these broken things and all the money that you've already spent before is sunk. It doesn't matter. Your decision on whether you need to trade in and start making payments on a new car instead of fixing your old one should only be based on the costs that are coming in the future. Okay, so some costs are tough and it's tough in a business setting as tough as it is in any personal setting, but we have to really be careful about uh, not considering sunk costs, right? The second kind are opportunity costs. And if anything, these are even harder because opportunity costs are the cost of not doing something else. 
And this is like saying, predict the future, but predict the future that you didn't know didn't happen. And that's pretty confusing, right? So the opportunity cost is the cost of doing or not doing something else. I think the easiest way to think about opportunity cost is again to go back to the land example. So let's say I bought a, a plot of land on King Street for a million dollars. That million dollars is a sunk cost. Ten years ago, that was the cost. Doesn't matter what, what it was, I don't consider it in my new project. What I do consider is the opportunity cost of, no, of using the land in a different way. So I could do lots of things with the land now, right? I could build uh, an apartment building, I could build some offices, I could put a bank or, or a restaurant, I could uh, put a bar or a small grocery store or a different kind of store. I could do any number of things with the land. Whatever project I am planning on, let's say, go back to our burger joint. I'm gonna open up a burger restaurant right there on King Street, I'm gonna build my restaurant. The relevant cost of the land is not the sunk cost, it's not what we paid for it. It's the opportunity cost of not doing something else with the land. Now this is a really hard thing to conceptualize. For instance, what's the opportunity cost? What's my cost of not opening up an apartment building instead of a restaurant? Maybe I make more money selling, uh, you know, renting out apartments, uh, you know, and, and it's more steady. Uh, maybe it's not as reliant on, on tourism like a restaurant might be. M you know, so maybe I make more money in one versus the other, but how do, I, how do I estimate that kind of thing? It's really hard. But the one thing that I can estimate, the one lost option that I can estimate with pretty good certainty is the cost of not selling the land. In other words, my baseline opportunity cost in lots of examples is just the fact that if I already own something, the thing that I could do instead of building on it or instead of using it is selling it. And so the relevant cost that I put into my project analysis is the cost of the, or is the value of the land now, what I would be able to sell it for. Not what I paid for it, but what I could sell it for, okay, market value. And this might be different. Again, the land value might have dropped to 750,000 and I paid a million, in which case, the relevant cost is only 750000 because that's all I could get for the land otherwise. And that million dollars, it's sunk. I've, I've already, I've lost that two hundred fifty grand. I don't consider it as part of the project because it doesn't affect whether I take the project or not. That value has already disappeared. If I build the bank or the grocery store or the restaurant or the apartment building, the cost is 750000 for the land. And that two hundred fifty in value, it's already disappeared. Likewise, if the land value went up, again, that doesn't affect us. We would now treat that as a higher cost of the land because I could sell it for more money. Right? So opportunity costs, they're hard to think about and what we'll often end up doing is using sort of a baseline opportunity cost. What could I do with this, uh, this thing that I own or this uh, uh, investment that I already have that I couldn't do before? Now side effects. Um, side effects are again, these are things that are hard to anticipate uh, but they can have real relative uh, either benefits or costs to the projects that you're taking on. So there's two sides to a side effect. There's a positive side effect, which is your project will bring a benefit to other projects that you already have. And there's negative side effects, which is your project will bring costs to other projects that you already have. So let's start by talking about negative side effects because realistically, these are the ones that we care about avoiding. right? I want to make sure that I've given as much thought as possible to the potential negative side effects uh, I, uh, that might be associated with my project. And these are, again, they're not easy to evaluate, they're not easy to think about. Humans aren't good, again, at predicting the future, so if I can't predict the future when I'm estimating cash flows, how can I predict the future about how this project will have negatively affect my other projects? And, and I say this, and, and I'm going to tell you a couple of examples here that even major companies, big companies that you would assume would have really good grasp on uh, project analysis and on thinking about side effects and things like that, even major companies like, say, McDonald's, uh, slip up on these negative side effects and have associated, uh, have taken on projects with major negative side effects um, and, and then taken a major hit, you know, a big negative cash flow hit from, from these projects because they hurt they're already existing projects. 